Hello, Sasha. Hi, Constance. I'm so happy to have you here today for our third season of Anchor Point. Um, it's really a pleasure to have you with us today because you are a very special friend to Boda Boda. Um, but we will get into that a bit later. So right now, I'd just like you to introduce yourself to us and why why you're so special to us. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big question. Well, firstly, thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Um, <clears throat> so my name is Sasha Alcalumbre, for those who don't know me. Uh, I'm a, uh, a trainer, so a movement instructor and a filmmaker. And why I'm so special to Boda <laughs> Boda, that's uh, maybe for you to tell me, but um, I think um, I kind of fit into the overall or overarching kind of themes uh, and offerings of the Boda Boda in the sense that um, it's more than just a spa. There's a a very much an, an emphasis on kind of holistic wellness and movement is one way of kind of achieving that, you know, that well-being. So I guess that's <laughs> what makes me special <laughs> is that I can bring in that element to the Boda. Absolutely. So yeah. for those of you who don't know, Sasha is a fitness instructor at Boda Boda. Um, so we've been doing that as a recurrent activity at Boda and it's been really great to have you bring in some new passengers and we have our old passengers trying out your classes and it's it's really been a great experience um can you tell us a bit about the package that you're actually doing with us at Bodak? yes so um we're combining uh one hour of a, an eccentrics class so eccentrics is a dynamic stretching and strengthening program that i've been teaching for 12 years now um and the class is focused a little bit more on uh, deep stretching and relaxation. There's different ways of teaching or of doing um, an eccentrics class. It could be more toning focused or, um, but this class is a little more kind of restorative. And we come, so we combine an hour of that with two hours of the water circuit, which is really an amazing package. <laughs> I mean, I, I do the, usually the water circuit after the class because I really enjoy that combo. Um, and it's, it's a nice way. It's usually on Sundays. We've been doing it on Sundays, uh, once a month uh, at 10 a.m. And so by 1 p.m. you're you're done, unless you take a massage as well, <laughs> uh, which I've also done. <laughs> um, and then, you know, but uh, it's a nice way to start the, the you know, a weekend day yeah. uh, and kind of to like, to let's say end the weekend. Like mm -hmm. I feel like you, you kind of keep that energy till the end of, of the evening on Sunday. So it's really kind of r restful and, and fun. It sounds like the perfect Sunday to me. Oh, it is. I have to it say. It is. The, the, especially the first times, it was quite cold and pretty sunny. So, yeah, just a, it's also like a beautiful way to engage with winter. And yeah. the Boda Boda is so beautiful for that because you have views on the, you know, the the St. Lawrence and everything is frozen. And so it's <laughs> it's like you're in the heat of a yeah. sauna, but looking out onto, you know, frozen so water. True. It's really, it's nice. So true. Um, can you take us back to your origins, who you are, um, what, uh, because you, you've been into fitness for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So take us back to <clears throat> the beginning, the your beginning. story. <laughs> um, I'll stick to this generation because there's many <laughs> <laughs> generations before and maybe, maybe a long story. But um, I, uh, so I'm, I'm from Montreal. I uh, actually used to be a national level figure skater. Um, for many years. I started when I was quite young. I must have been six or, or seven. And I got into competition, um, more serious competition around like you know, 11, 11 or 12 years old. And I did nationals for seven years um, from the age of 14 to, so I was on the Quebec team and um, basically training five hours a day, five days a week uh, from the age of 14 to the age of 21. Mm. And um, the fitness kind of obviously beyond the you know, the athletic career, the fitness and eccentrics especially came into play around, uh, um, yeah, when I was 18 years old, um, I had a bunch of injuries, um, mm. and notably an ankle injury. And, uh, I was, my physio had opened her clinic, uh, right basically below the eccentric studio. So eccentrics, um, so Miranda Desmond White is the creator of the program and she opened her studio with, with her daughter, Sarah. Um, right above the the physio's office, so and and it was just like you know the luck of uh, you know yeah. timing, <laughs> and my physio was like, oh, you should look into this. This might help for your injuries, 
And uh, I started taking classes with Miranda about three times a week. She was offering classes for athletes. So there were, mm -hmm. she used to work with like, at the time, all a ton of Montreal kind of Olympians. And uh, there were divers and um, <clears throat> figure skaters like myself, um, singles and pairs. There was uh, some, even some uh, pre-professional ballet dancers. Okay. So there was a nice group of, of people. And, uh, and then I started to see like massive changes in my body. Mm -hmm. And I was really convinced that I wanted to, to spread the kind of the, the, you know, the joy of movement as medicine, mm -hmm. really. That's it, like, I felt all of my injuries started to dissipate and my body was like really happy. And for the first time in my career, basically mm -hmm. at 18, when I was training for so many years, I was much less sore and, mm -hmm. And yeah, I think the holistic approach was really what I needed. So basically that's where I started. That's when I started teaching. I was probably like 19 when I started uh, my certification and teaching pretty much immediately. And uh, and I've kind of, yeah, I've been teaching more or less ever since. Um, but it's more recently, it's in the last year that I've really decided to do that f full time. Mm. Um, I had different jobs and lives, <laughs> but, uh, this is kind of my main, uh, yeah, my main, my main work right now. So you've been in that industry for a while. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> very long time. Can you tell us a bit about what you think that industry lacks and what we can mm -hmm. take away from it? What, what we should leave, yeah. <laughs> um, out and what we should take. Yeah. In? Well, it's interesting because I was thinking about this question um it's hard to say what it lacks because there's so much like it's so vast yeah. and um and i think social media has really given everyone an opportunity people who are i guess into to fitness mm -hmm. um to see all sorts of um types of trainers and all all, all types of methods and yeah. Uh, pedagogies and I mean it's like endless so I don't know if it lacks that much um, uh, but what I think there's too much of is people and I think I think part of it is also the fact that like social media is a big um, kind of tool for marketing mm -hmm. and what works a lot on social media and in the fitness industry is kind of this uh, you know adulation of of the individual of the personality and so what happens is that people in these positions of you know who have a, a big following and whatever um they tend to kind of overstep i think their mm -hmm. their qualifications and that to me is like what you know what sh what should or ideally would need to change yeah. but it probably won't yeah. but it's it's basically people kind of not staying in their lane and you know all of a sudden claiming all sorts of mm -hmm. things about nutrition and about um you know a way like of life. Sp a spiritual yeah. um things and this and that and it doesn't mean that you know trainers aren't also can't also be experienced yeah. in you know those fields and there's a lot of really um you know qualified people and mm -hmm. That, that have like a nice array of, of um, you know, skills over different disciplines. But I do, do think a lot of the times like that overlap can be a little dangerous. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the claims can be, you know, false uh, and pseudoscientific a lot of the times. So, yeah, that's basically what I would say the industry would need to like cut back on. It's funny little. because I feel like fitness and wellness obviously are like intertwined. Yeah. And <clears throat> what you're saying just rings so many bells. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's for the client to to be careful, like be aware of yeah. like where you get your classes from, from who, like, you know, it's, yeah, be smart about it. Definitely, you know? definitely. But on the, the flip side, I do think there's an incredible amount of really capable and talented people. And it's amazing to like, to be able to witness like and discover people on, you know, yeah. online, on social media, on YouTube, all sorts, I mean, yeah, really amazing people. So, yeah, it's just about, I think, finding what resonates the most with you and also doing your research as an individual. And it's it's hard because yeah. I think that's how it is in, like, all fields. Like, I'm not mm -hmm. a specialist in a lot of things, right? <laughs> like, um, So I also seek knowledge and I seek um, people's, you know, opinions and stuff. And But I try to balance that out with doing my own research and, yeah, finding, like, a middle ground. I do believe that truth is somewhere in the middle um, and that everyone's kind of 
especially when it comes to like wellness or well-being and and movement and whatever uh everyone's truth is different Mm -hmm. so yeah Yeah. so finding finding your own kind of path amongst all the different voices can you uh tell us a bit about your walk into entrepreneurship because as you mentioned Mm -hmm. you've been doing this for a little bit um full time so tell us about that experience Ah. and tell us about your brand as well yeah um so so yeah i started this i guess this brand about or i i became an entrepreneur i guess about a year ago um and it's been like a complete um flip basically my life is completely flipped i used to have an office job um i had like uh you know a certain type of stability in my schedule and uh you know it was there was more regularity um and so starting uh, this business from scratch, I guess. Uh, I'm still still working on, <laughs> on you know, growing. But yeah, it's it's uh, it's been really interesting because it it's allowed me to, I think, self rely a lot more, and it's something that I'm really used to doing. Uh, between uh, my athletic career, that was just like at working, being a, a figure skater, especially a singles skater, yeah. um, you're kind of confronted to yourself all the time. And uh, I think that taught me a lot about discipline and just like <clears throat> pushing forward every day and like every day working towards a specific goal. So it's not, uh, it, it didn't feel like unfamiliar to me. Mm-hmm. It felt very, very comfortable to walk into that space or walk into kind of that mindset. Um, and yeah, I've, I've, I think I've like grown tremendously from it. Uh, and as much as it can be challenging and every person that's ever tried anything <laughs> entrepreneurial will, you know, acknowledge that yeah. but it's been, it's been really rewarding on so many, so many levels, uh, especially on a, just a personal growth level Yeah, and feeling like I'm m- more in control of my life than ever before. So how do you stay grounded and anchored in all of the different things that a day has to offer (laughs) because I'm guessing your schedule is not you know a nine to five yeah well that's a work in progress (laughs) definitely um I think that's something I'm kind of getting to now I think the first year uh for me anyways and and I'm sure for a lot of people when you start a business you kind of have to do everything and try um going in all sorts of directions and it's hard to maintain that balance especially at the beginning now I'm starting to feel like, okay, there's a little more consistency in my, uh, slightly more consistency, consistency in my schedule. So what, what I'm trying to work on actually is like finding the time for myself yeah. to ground myself. And sometimes like I used to think that grand, gra- uh, uh, grounding myself was basically like dependent on me, like not moving and resting and, <laughs> And sometimes it's not like sometimes I actually do need to do something that is active because that's my nature. I also need to like balance it out yeah. with like more, you know, restful a more restful state, uh, which is not always my forte. But um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I can't quite answer that because I'm still working through mm-hmm. it. But like finding, you know, trying to find schedules or, or, or like moments in my schedule. Yeah. Uh, you know, to go to a yoga class if I can, to go to a spinning class if I can, to do some breath work that's been, mm-hmm. I'm trying to really incorporate that uh, into my daily life because that you can do yeah. from anywhere, right? And once in a while do, uh, you know, a Pilates class or video. Um, yeah, so figuring it out, trying <laughs> to be creative amongst all of that too. That's also a way to, to stay grounded. For sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so as you see, there's no no clear cut answer <laughs> for no now. There's no answer, you guys. It's it's gonna happen. I'm sure. I was listening to a podcast about grief the other day, which is not the topic of this conversation. <laughs> but the person doing the podcast was asking um, the people on air what was their form of self care mm-hmm. through grief, but all, because grief can you know look like many different things. And so there was one person that was like, oh, I I like to watch like what is it like Britain's cooking show yeah, or something? Yeah. <laughs> and then so like a lot of people were saying, oh, I watch like reality TV or I watch whatever. And then this other girl was like, I don't 
I don't do self-care in the sense, kind of like what you were saying, be, staying like put. And she was like, I like to go outside and like do things like that's my form of self-care. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because for me, self-care for a very long time. And I think through like media and stuff, mm-hmm. we've always talked about self-care as like doing a face mask or like taking a bath mm-hmm. or, you know, something very still. Mm-hmm. And it's refreshing to hear that like mm-hmm. self-care doesn't have to be like you at home under the covers not moving <laughs> and De- that it can be active self-care definitely. can be active for definitely sure. i think self-care is really just like a reconnection or just reconnecting yeah. to yourself totally um so whatever shape that that takes or that yeah. is you know like i find actually somehow like my most meditative meditative moments are when i'm like grinding really hard in mm. a spin class and i'm like yeah. about to die <laughs> but i'm like i am just focusing on breathing and yeah. you know and and that to me like refreshes me it like gives yeah. me you know that moment where i'm in complete flow in a flow state yeah. where i'm no longer you know outputting i am but it's for my for myself like when you teach your outputting but for your your clients yeah. and for your class and you forget about yourself and especially how I teach, I teach, I'm very physical in the way I teach. So I'm not moving for myself. Yeah. Like it's, I'm not thinking, oh, this is a good workout for me. It's like, I'm trying to go as far in my movement so people can understand how to do theirs. Yeah. And sometimes I overdo it, mm-hmm. but I'm, I'm, I'm better at, at pacing myself than I used to be. But yeah, just coming back to like my own body yeah. and my mind um, and not in a way that's like performative, quote unquote, for others. Yeah. I think it's about like that mindfulness factor, right? Yeah. It's about, I took a, a class that we also offer at Boda with Sebastian Zeppa, who was yeah. also yeah. on the podcast last season. Which I listened to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we did a lot of breath work, as you mentioned, and it was my first time doing mm-hmm. breath work. And I found it so fascinating because it was really a way for myself to be super grounded in mm-hmm. the present moment through breath. Mm-hmm. And because we don't know how to breathe properly most of the time. So it was really yeah, interesting to like, mm-hmm. and also through your classes, you always remind us to like breathe in, breathe out, like, mm-hmm. you know, concentrate our, on how we mm-hmm. function. Because during your classes, we're very, there's a lot of movement, movement that's mostly pretty slow, but you know, you have to focus on your breathing and on moving. And it's like, I don't think we're used to, we're used to doing a bunch of things at the same time, but we're not used to being mindful about all these things. Mm -hmm. Half of the things we're going to do, we're not even going to remember we did them, right? So I think fitness in that sense Mm -hmm. is so important because Mm -hmm. it really teaches you to Mm -hmm. focus and remember what you're doing. Yeah, (laughs) It's amazing. Um, Can you tell us a bit more about eccentrics and like what it does and why it's important um, to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so eccentrics is important to do because, um, well, before I talk about eccentrics, actually, I think, uh, you know, what's important is to find, you know, a method or find a class or find, uh, YouTube videos or find whatever you can, um, you know, a tool for your body to realign, to be rebalanced, meaning, uh, you know, our day-to-day life kind of uh, un- imbalances our body. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we're sitting at a desk a lot. If that's our, you know, our main job, let's say it's working at a desk, our, you know, shoulders tend to go forward. Uh, so we shorten our pectorals and our traps in the upper back weaken. And so that, you know, affects our posture and what happens in the pelvis is we're slightly you know in a in a posterior tilt Mm -hmm. and then you're putting pressure on your lumbar spine so you know if that's your eight hours of day uh uh, you know in a day you're you're doing that for eight hours in a day obviously your body is out of whack (laughs) and out of balance (laughs) and so you need a practice that helps you rebalance that you know um and beyond like just the the daily activities where our, our bodies are not you know they're not naturally perfectly aligned so you have to kind of e- even like uh you know on a base level like without the activities that kind of like worsen the state of the body just on a base level most bodies are uh, a little um, imbalanced or a little crooked so to speak mm-hmm. like you know perfect alignment is something you want to achieve not perfect but ideal alignment for each person which yeah. looks different so you want that practice that kind of recenters your body and so for me eccentrics is one of those practices pilates is too and i'm um soon going to be offering uh reformer pilates which i, I really have 
become obsessed with, <laughs> uh, like a lot of people who do it. But so Eccentrics is um, an amazing kind of uh, midpoint. I think it's a really nice entry point mm -hmm. also for people who don't work out that much or who aren't so, you know, uh, movement focused mm -hmm. because it really gets every single joint moving uh, in a way that's still pretty gentle. Um, so you're, you're strengthening your, your, your muscles and your joints and your body in through dynamic stretching. And what, what is that basically it's uh, stretching in a way that's, that's, you know, movement oriented, that's not passive. So you're, you're actively stretching your muscles, um, and you're training them to, to stay in an elongated position yeah. to decompress, which means that you're creating a little more quote unquote space. Uh, in your joints. And that's what your body needs because over time with gravity, with just so gravitational pull towards, you know, um, the center of the earth, <laughs> being <laughs> a little, <laughs> yeah, a little dramatic here, but there, there's that pull, there's sitting at a desk, that kind of pull, um, all of our activities are usually leaning forward when we cook, when we lift, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so everything is shortening. You need something that lengthens, that creates that opposition. And that's what eccentrics does. And that's why I love it. It's like that prehistoric image of like, you know how like men were in the prehistoric times and then they s slowly started walking. <laughs> yes. And now we're like kind of going oh, back to that. A hundred percent. We're going to finish this interview crawling on the floor. <laughs> like totally, <this. laughs> totally. Yeah, well, it, you know, if you look at like, you know, mankind in, 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 in general and you look at, uh, you know, the different kind of eras and species and whatever, but um, mostly like let's say in the last 2000 years, like we went from being, uh, you know, uh, very agricultur agriculturally focused society yeah. of like, you know, most of the times you work with your body to a very sedentary, yeah. very, very sedentary um, kind of workforce, right? Or lifestyle. Yeah. So just that um, is reason enough to like find something in that, that fits in your lifestyle and your, your, your schedule, whatever that's like, yeah, kind of, helping you stay sane, like physically sane. Yeah. Have you noticed common injuries in people that, I mean, there's probably a plethora of injuries. Yeah, it's just like everything, <laughs> like all of the injuries, there's <laughs> everything. But yeah, uh, oftentimes, um, and I think injuries, I mean, there's so many different kinds of injuries and uh, yeah. like there's accident injuries where you, you know, you fall off the chair and whatever, break your leg, I mean. Hopefully that That's doesn't happen to anyone. Spot. I don't know. I was trying to come up with an imagery, but there's also, um, there's like stress injuries of like doing repeating yeah. re repetitive movements, uh, in a way that's, you know, unhealthy or, yeah. or imbalanced and that, uh, weakens certain areas and then you get injured. Um, yeah. And, and that seems to be a little more frequent, but I also, you know, I think injuries occur when you aren't you you don't know how to use your body yeah um and you're doing you know a certain type of effort or physical effort you haven't done before right. um so yeah that's that's also part of how i teach like i want to in my pedagogy i want to give the tools for to my clients for them to just be able to use their body in any situation mm -hmm. like if they love um you know running how can they optimize their their training and their body for that activity yeah and how can they avoid or prevent injuries by working certain muscles in certain ways and at certain times you know like in their warm-ups and their cool downs like yeah. what are they focusing on and yeah that's my goal is to basically and i think eccentrics is great for that and it pilates too it's like you're you 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 know there's different exercises to target different muscle groups and you can basically have that as you know or include those types of exercises in your daily routine once you know how to do them yeah and, and they're, and they're accessible, you yeah. know. What I love about Eccentrics as well and what you teach is that it's not about having things on this side that are going to help you tone. What you say is always like the body like tones the body. You don't say that, but <laughs> but we use like our own weight as like a toning mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of like strength training in mm -hmm. what we do, except it's not. Yeah. Yeah, you you're not we're, you're using external side. weights. Um, you know, there's virtues to all kinds of movement. Yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, weight bearing exercises, whether it's with your body weight, with um, external weights can be great. Yeah. It just depends how it's done. Exactly. So, yeah. but what's great about teaching, you know, eccentrics 
uh, in, you know, the way it's supposed to be taught. Mm -hmm. So without any external weights um, and just using, you know, the the weight of the arms to strengthen the shoulders, the weight of the legs, strengthen the hips is that um, injuries are much less frequent. Mm -hmm. If like I've never heard of anyone getting injured with eccentrics. Um, And even if you do it kind of, you don't do it that well because it's your first class and the movements are complex, you're still going to get a lot out of it. And that general movement is going to be way better than like no movement at all. Um, But yeah, it's, it's definitely super, it can be super strengthening. Uh, You can strengthen your body without, without having, you know, a set of 20 million dumbbells at home and you can just, it can be really simple. Yeah. And I feel like most people don't realize that actually, Mm -hmm. that it it can be so simple. Mm -hmm. Um, I watched recently a show with Chris Hemsworth <laughs> um, for National Geographic. Oh, wow. Um, so fun pairing. Uh, so Chris Hemsworth plays Thor in the Marvel right. movie. So he is a big chunk of a man. Yeah, he is. Um, and so this whole series is like, I think, in five episodes. And he is the protagonist of the series. Yeah. And he wants to look at a bunch of different ways to not stop aging but like make aging a process that is like the least painful thing ever Mm -hmm. so every episode he dives into like a certain topic Mm. so in one of the episodes he goes um cold plunging so that's like very typical of boda boda obviously um there's another one uh where he does a bunch of stuff for his mind because like mental health Mm -hmm. and how you work your brain is also a way to stop well not stop aging but like make again aging a slower and less painful process. Um, so he talks a lot about Alzheimer's and stuff like that. And in the last, I don't want to spoil anything, but in the last episode, he also looks as, at aging as like just a natural and normal mm-hmm. process that we can't mm-hmm. stop. And that, you know, there's no amount of like facial creams and anti-wrinkle things and that are going to make us not get old. Mm-hmm. And he puts on this incredible suit that's like made up of a bunch of random elastics and things and he also puts on a helmet and these like weird goggles so all of this suit is supposed to show what it feels like when you're old so he's like 38 or something and that suit on him is basically him being like an 80 year old man and it's so funny because you know he's so in shape and he's so incredibly strong and he is so limited by all his movements because there's like this huge elastic band that's like holding his wrist from like his waist and he's having and so at some point he goes to like a a fitness class for like older people and he has such a hard time doing the the most Mm -hmm. mundane things Mm -hmm. and i when i was watching this i kept on thinking about eccentrics and i was like if he had started eccentrics earlier He would, you know, yeah. he would get it. Well, I, that's, you know, that's what's uh, amazing about about movement and introducing it, you know, early on is yeah. that you're you're kind of defying uh, the clock, right? And what happens is with the least the, the 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 less you move over time, the more certain muscles in your body weaken and atrophy, yeah. and that's what long term it's not only the muscles it's the connective tissue as well which is surrounds the muscles surrounds the cells and it kind of calcifies or it like it hardens and when that kind of layer of uh, of aging let's say kicks into your body it's much harder to reverse yeah. and so that's like years and years and years of like lack of movement and it can happen to to people who are active because mm-hmm. they don't work certain muscle groups yes, right exactly so but that's that's a whole kind of purpose of eccentrics in a way. So Miranda Desmond White, who created the program, uh, she uh, wrote some books uh, called Aging Backwards, and mm. and basically like the whole uh, idea of the program is is based around yeah full body movement, all joints, all muscles being uh, solicited so that you uh, you don't really age uh, muscularly or or physically at the same rate you would if you were yeah. less mobile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or less in movement. I think it's important when we look at aging and stuff to, as you said, focus on different ways mm-hmm. to get your body moving. And again, in that show, at some point, he works on strength. Yeah. And as we know, he's super big because he plays Thor. And the entire, the entire show, I think, takes up a year of mm-hmm. his life. So he has a lot of filming to do in that sense mm-hmm. as well. So he has to bulk up at some point to play Thor. Right. 
So he eats like <laughs> 45 yeah. steaks in a day, like with eggs. I don't know. It's just a <laughs> lot. Um, and during that time, one of the episodes, again, is strengths. And he has to, at the end of every episode, he has to like do a certain really intense thing. Mm -hmm. And in that one, it's climb up a rope. Mm -hmm. But in the middle of like this giant forest and the rope is like attached to a helicopter and it's just like like nobody would do that in real life right <laughs> um, but it's funny to see because automatically when you look at somebody that has a lot of muscle mm -hmm. you're like oh he's super strong he can do mm -hmm. anything but the thing is is that he's bulking up for something that's like more aesthetic than actually body mm -hmm. functional mm -hmm. so when he first starts to try to climb up a rope Mm -hmm. He, like, can't even go up, like, one meter. Mm -hmm. Like, he has such a hard time. And I think it's so fascinating when you look at someone that physically looks super fit, but in the end, mm -hmm. like, I mean, you're not going to have to climb ropes every day mm -hmm. of your life, but what I mean is that the body can do certain things at certain times. Mm -hmm. It's not because you look healthy. Well, that you can well, that's the stuff. thing. I think the, the, the fact that, um, you know, our brain has been, like, uh, just so the imprint of, you know, magazines and or magazine covers and uh social media and whatever like has kind of uh, biased our view of of yeah. what a body should look like uh and a, a strong body should look like um and honestly like for me the the look of a body i mean especially when i think of like my clients that's like just not it's not a goal i i consider unless it's something they really want to focus on but yeah. For me, strength is that balance between uh, like mobility or, or actually, no, strength is essentially mobility because mobility is um, equal parts of flexibility um, and strength, right? So strength to me, and it can vary really per person, it depends what your activity is. Yeah. Like if you're, you know, like you said, if you're climbing a, a rope, you have to have that strength. But, but to me in a day-to-day -day life, like your strength is your ability to do all the activities you want to do and be resilient. So basically like uh, prevent or avoid injuries, uh, have no pain or the least amount of pain possible. It's being able to be 70 or 80 and, uh, you know, if you have grandkids, uh, be able to hold them, to play with them, to yeah. bend over. You know, it's like, it, it's all those things to me. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I guess, like, I don't kind of adopt the traditional view of, of strength. But uh, I think everyone would be, I think it would be beneficial for yeah. the world to shift into that. Yeah. Uh, or that mind frame to just look at mobility as, like, actual It's strength. a long-term thing. Yeah. I think mostly in fitness, sometimes we look at like the plastic of it all, where mm -hmm. it's like, I want to look a certain way and that's mm -hmm. fine. But it's also, mm -hmm. I think we will gain more out of looking at fitness as a long-term plan, more so than short-term, I want to look, yeah. you know, snatched for the summer, yeah. which also is a great thing. It's a great thing, yeah, but, <laughs> but, but it, you know, it's a form of like health insurance, really. Totally. Like, totally. essentially what you're, you know, the, the amount of time you invest uh, yeah. in your in conditioning let's call it conditioning because yeah. you're you're conditioning your body for all the things you want to do totally. um that kind of investment uh is something that you will like reap the benefits of f you know for as long as you live yeah as long as that's consistent yeah um, yeah yeah i have a friend who's training for a marathon and she has had this like weird knee situation for a while, but she just kind of didn't want to look at it. And she mm -hmm. went to the doctors the other week and he told her she had some sort of, as you said, like stress fracture or something. So she can't do the marathon mm -hmm. because she has to chill out for a sec. And she was telling me that, so she turned 30 um, in the fall and she was like, I can tell that my body is aging and I don't mm. like it. And she's a friend that also just does not like to age <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> um, and she was like, when I was 20, I could like run and mm -hmm. not stretch before, not stretch after. And I was fine. And she's like, now I, I can't do that. <laughs> And it, I was like, maybe, maybe that's normal. <laughs> like, it's actually funny because someone had <laughs> mentioned that. And to me, it's just crazy because not crazy, but like as an athlete, there was never really a time where I could like do things without warming up. Or yeah. I mean, some, some people have more resilient bodies, maybe like that wasn't my case. That's, <laughs> I needed to, I, I, I would, I started to, to be less injured and like, you know, in better shape when I was really consistent about my, you know, warm ups and cool downs as an 18 year old. Okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so to me, like people like going for a run or doing things without warming up or cooling down, uh, 
it, it's ludicrous like <laughs> <laughs> because it's a physical activity and you do need to prepare your body before you know that kind of impact yeah. um but i get that that's not everyone's like background like that was my experience um but yes like the the body is actually not really meant like when you're you're in your 20s yes maybe there's a little more uh you're faster at recovering yeah. basically at like in each decade you your recovery uh takes a little longer right. because your cellular regeneration is a little slower but that can be kind of hacked by how much movement yes. you, you do and like basically your metabolism can stay quite um fast and uh recover like quite quickly and, like yeah d a fo uh, based on how much you know how how you train your body yeah uh but yeah like i think a lot of the times also it's it's just in your early 20s you're less conscious yeah and like you know you can you just won't feel things or you won't pay attention to them the way you do when you're in your 30s. So this is a PSA for every 20-year-old yeah. out there. <laughs> Literally. Well, it's like, you know, when you're in your 20s and, you know, people who are like, and this was also not my case. I think I was just an old an old soul, old body forever. <laughs> but like, you know, people are like, yeah, I used to like go out and drink so much right. and like, and feel fine. Yeah. I'm like, I never felt fine. <laughs> um, You've just been an 80 year old just man. Basically. So, so I think a lot of it is tied to like, yeah, how conscious or you are uh, to, or how, how body aware you are. Maybe. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I love that. So everyone warm up, please. Warm up and cool down. <laughs> Any age, all ages. <laughs> Um, so you've mentioned that you're a filmmaker as yes. well. Um, this is no secret now that I've been taking your classes for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an avid student. Um, and what I've noticed and what I know you've been incorporating in your brand a lot is like mixing that whole universe of filmmaking mm -hmm. into your classes um, through movement, but also through your playlists, which are amazing. And <laughs> I always feel like I'm in a movie. I'm like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's always so amazing. Um, so... How difficult is it to merge these two worlds? And do you do it on purpose, like actively on purpose? Or, yeah, how do these two worlds collide so perfectly? Um, I don't think, I mean, I, I, I don't think in this case anyways, I don't think it's really on purpose. It's just like it stems from the same place. Like when I put together a playlist, um, I'm thinking of an emotional, I, that's also part of, it's a, it's a, a pedagogical tool. Uh, music is a pedagogical pedagogical tool in eccentrics, but also in other types of you know fitness classes. So it can be really used to your advantage to be able to communicate kind of the uh, the amount of effort required in each mm -hmm. exercise. Um, and then beyond the like individual songs, individual exercises, for me it's really important to create a flow because well, one I love music, <laughs> um, and I want people to get get into a flow yeah. and for there to be kind of an emotional uh you know evolution throughout the class like a movie uh, yeah and so <laughs> i it stems from the same place it stems from a creative place so and for me like film and teaching and like all the things i do are not like i don't see them as as separate i really see them as one and the same which i know for most people might be confusing um but that's just how it is <laughs> i mean it's such a holistic approach too to kind of look at the different spheres of your life that you mm -hmm. love so much and that you're actually so good at and to find a way to merge them i think is a magical mm -hmm. thing because not everyone can do that so thank you but it's it's i wouldn't say it's like super conscious too it's yeah. just like it's something i i enjoy doing so yeah. i yeah which yeah. makes it even more magical yeah. <laughs> because you're like, I don't even have to think about it. This well, is working on plays is hard. <laughs> I have to do my research. For sure. But yeah. <laughs> so delving into that world, uh, the world of filmmaking, mm -hmm. um, you had your first short movie filmed in 20, what was it? 18? So yeah, I made it in 2018 and it uh, came out in 2019. So it started its festival kind of circuit. 2019. Yeah. So can you tell us a bit about that movie first mm -hmm. before we dive into the rest? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the film is called Three Months. It's actually a French language film. So Trois Mois, uh, the original title. And it basically is about uh, a romance between these two guys that wavers when one of the characters reveals um, belatedly that he's HIV positive. So it's basically about that negotiation, like later into a relationship of like, okay, something was uh, not shared and uh, it's about trust and it's about communication. Uh, it's about love, uh, overcoming stigma or overcoming, uh, you know, the, the falling out of trust. Mm. Um, 
so yeah, that's more or less it. And the film went to a bunch of festivals in Canada, in the States, uh, in Europe, uh, in India, Ooh. and yeah, in <laughs> Asia as well. Oh. Uh, I think it was Hong Kong. Yeah, so it kind of had its its moment. And uh, also, we could watch it on Air Canada planes. <laughs> oh yeah, so it was it was also uh, picked up by Air Canada. I don't think it's it's. I think the the the, the period is, 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 is over. Yeah, but, uh, that, it was but that was also, fun. It was also on, on CBC. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I it yes. had a it really. It surprised me in in uh, in you know the way it was it was uh, appreciated. I yeah, guess yeah, for sure. And you're also working on a new short yes. right now. Is there something you can tell us about it? Um, yeah, I can. I'll I'll give you a short yeah, you know short synopsis. It. So um, a very different story. It's basically the portrait of this um, elderly woman who. Uh, in short, falls alone in her home after having hosted a family, a big family meal. Um, and it's basically about her kind of, not necessarily will to live, but like her her life being uh, like, a f- uh, what's the word? See, I, I should I should pitch it more often. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to reveal not too much. So basically, yes, it's it's the- about her her being shaken. And um, really acknowledging the fact that her life is changing, that she is entering a new era. Mm. She actually, the mobility aspect yeah. is really a big part of it. She's losing a bit of mobility and her hearing is uh, a, a little great difficult. For, for yeah, <laughs> exactly. It somehow <laughs> makes sense. But it's like, <laughs> stay mobile. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, yeah, so it's basically about kind of this transition uh, in her life. And it's it's not so much a big narrative arc like there isn't a big you know like quest and yeah. it's it's really a portrait of this moment and uh and of her shifting and and acknowledging it through words to one of her grandchildren yeah so in both movies i mean they're very different but um i can sense that there's some sort of recurrent theme within mm-hmm. love and um how we show up for other people and is that was that a conscious decision and why are these themes so they seem important to you so so why <laughs> i mean love should be an important theme <laughs> love should be an important theme um once again i don't know <laughs> i have like this is the podcast with the least amount of like straightforward <laughs> answers i'm really sorry i apologize no because i think it's also it, it shows that you know creating an mm-hmm. art and Everything is a process. It's a process and it's in- intuitive. Like I, I think with filmmaking, uh, especially at the pace I'm doing it, which is like very glacial. <laughs> <laughs> One movie every 7 million years. Um, I mean, it's a budget <laughs> and it's time. And definitely, it's normal. <laughs> definitely, definitely. No, but it's a process. <laughs> I think um, for me, it's it's really important to do something that that comes like from the heart, obviously. Uh, I think most filmmakers will say the same thing because um, projects take really a long time to come to life. Yeah. Um, especially with this one, I'm like last one, the turnover was a little faster because it was more like guerrilla style. We had no funding and it was, uh, you know, we were younger yeah. and my, my team and I, we just wanted to do this. And the recovery process was faster. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, <laughs> it took me a while to recover from that one. Um, but this, this, in this case, um, I'm I already have half the funding secured, and I'm working on the second half. And it's it's I started writing this like nearly two years ago, so it's it's a much longer haul yeah. because I want to do it right and I want to um, do it in the right conditions. Um, but where was I going with that? <laughs> no, you were you were asking me a question, and I, I was asked the the theme how. Why are these themes so important to you, and why are they recurrent? In uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> my digressions are really spectacular today. Um, so basically, uh, yeah, you want to do you want to as a filmmaker, you want to make especially if you're going the funding route and stuff, you want to um, have projects that you can be with for a long time. Mm-hmm. So they have to be really close to your heart, and they have to. Uh, resonate with you for much longer than you think so there has to be really like you have to to have a sense of purpose and like why you're doing this why you're putting this story out in the world why is it different why is it important um and I guess like maybe for me love is 
you know, in all of its facets is just something that's like eternal yeah. and uh, universal. Mm -hmm. And especially, you know, with this one, let's say the love of a grandmother for her family, a, a matriarch for her family uh, and the family for the matriarch is something that I felt like was really not lacking, but like I didn't mm. see much of. And That's I think true. we, we, you know, the grandmother is such an important, uh, such an important piece of the puzzle in so many cultures. Yeah. So it felt like the right thing. Um, and it stemmed also from like, I started thinking about this, this film when we were in lockdown and I was mm. thinking about my grandmother yeah. and thinking about uh, <clears throat> just like, a, a very solitary life at a certain age, right? When your uh, your spouse uh, passed away many years ago, and uh, you're less capable of doing, you know, all the things you want to do. Yeah. So pre-pandemic, even, and then we were in this state as 20, 30 year olds, and you know, the whole world was. And so I was thinking about kind of that that uh, solitary confinement. Yeah. And yeah. Anyways, uh, sad, sad topics. But I wanted yeah. to I wanted to delve into that. It's a true one. Yeah. And I think that the pandemic definitely shed light on a lot of that solitude for older people. Yeah. But in the end, I think they're mostly more they feel that solitude like not it, you don't need a pandemic for older people to feel alone. Yeah, and exactly. I think that's yeah. something that you're showcasing. It's beautiful. Oh, I hope it will be. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It's not. It is in yet. my head. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna hope that that process is is um, as easy for you as possible. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, kind of to wrap all of this beautiful conversation, can you tell us what wellness means to you, well-being, mm -hmm. and how? it appears in your life on a daily basis. I don't know if we feel wellness on a daily basis, <laughs> but. Well, it's interesting. Um, I was thinking, I actually researched um, the definition of wellness mm -hmm. and there is a Global Wellness Institute. Yes. And if I recall correctly, it basically defined like in its, you know, more most succinct way, defined wellness as the kind of active pursuit um, of activities and, you know, lifestyles that uh, contribute to an overall like, holistic lifestyle yeah. uh and basically like wellness is like the from these kinds of this kind of definition it's like the pursuit of um a life in which you're kind of kind of thriving so yeah. i think wellness is uh can look like a different it, it can have a different face for mm -hmm. different people um and i don't really want to define it i think I also think like for me before reading this for all because it's a it's a buzzword right yeah, like, yeah and it, for sure like everyone uses it wellness oh gosh, wellness wellness yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. and for me I, I always kind of associated it to like a very like passive state of like we've reached a state of wellness kind of like we've reached a state of happiness which okay. isn't realistic have we like, though <laughs> no but that's it it's like it's not realistic to like yeah. reach a point and it's it's also like. I think it's something you want to you can consider only once you've you have like your basic basic necessities met. So yeah. it's just it's not like it's a very privileged kind of um, term or mm -hmm. um, but I guess like in my life and I, I have to admit I am privileged and I'm uh, I'm very fortunate yeah. and I'm very appreciative of the lifestyle I have and of the country I live in and mm -hmm. so on. But um, yeah, I think wellness maybe to me uh is yeah it's it's a, a juggling act and it's it's finding some sort of harmony through the chaos of life yeah that's what wellness is and harmony meaning like you know through different lenses whether it's through your physical and mental health or spiritual yeah kind of being a uh, creative uh self so it's finding kind of a uh yeah like a the heart of all those things, finding a middle ground for all those things, like a meeting point, actually, that's yeah. what it is for all those things. And how does it... An anchor point. An anchor point. Oh, there you go. <laughs> anchor, boda boda, boats, <laughs> water. <laughs> um, and so how it manifests uh, itself in my life or like how wellness, that's the last point of your question, Yeah. how it appears in my life. Um, honestly, I, I find like beyond like my own pursuit of wellness and finding that grounding and that anchor anchor point. Like I do think like my work, both filmmaking and teaching mm -hmm. are really 
like they contribute to my own wellness, but mm -hmm. also, especially, I mean, the teaching, they contribute to other people's wellness. And like, that's how wellness kind of um, appears in my life. It's yeah. really through my work, uh, first and foremost. And it gives me a lot of sense, a, a big sense of purpose. Yeah. And I appreciate contributing. And I'm very grateful to be able to contribute to people's lives. And I guess filmmaking, in a way, does can do that too, right? Because you're communicating something, uh, you know, that goes beyond yourself. Yeah. You're touching people, hopefully, on a more profound level. And if it can make them, you know, reflect on things. And, uh, you know, that also is a form of, of wellness. It's, totally. you know, putting things into perspective. I love that. So maybe that's what it is. <laughs> We found no, the I don't know. It's like it makes no sense. <laughs> but but yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, amazing. Thank you for those words. Um, can you just let us know where we can find you? So um, you can find me online. Uh, uh, my Instagram handle is at embody um, underscore W underscore, uh, underscore Sasha. So embody with Sasha or on my <clears throat> website, embodywithsasha.com. Um, and I teach, uh, out of a studio in Westmount. I teach online as well. So yeah, all of my schedule is up on my website and on Instagram. I'm pretty active. So feel free to send me a message. Amazing. Thank you so much, Sasha. Thanks for having me. See you soon. See you.